Hey there, welcome back to graph theory. In this video, we're going to discuss some useful terminology about graphs. In the first few parts of this week's videos, we discussed graphs, digraphs, and applications to PageRank. In order to do those applications, we also discussed Markov chains and Markov matrices. In this video, we'll go over some basic terminology about graphs, but we will not focus on digraphs today. Starting out, we'll look at some special types of graphs. Then, we'll look at some special kinds of vertices in graphs. And finally, we'll define some graph parameters. In the previous videos, we discussed several special families of graphs, including paths, cycles, complete graphs, and bipartite graphs. All of these graphs that we discussed before are called simple graphs. Simple graphs are unweighted, undirected, and they are graphs that contain no self loops or multiple edges. Whenever we discuss graphs in this class, we will assume that they are simple, unless I say otherwise. Later in the course, we will consider some graphs that are not simple, but I'll tell you in advance when we get to graphs that aren't simple. If we consider the graph of a social network's connections, for example, Facebook friends, this graph will typically be simple since you cannot be your own Facebook friend and you cannot have multiple Facebook friendships with the same other user. On the other hand, if we consider a different graph, the graph obtained by letting vertices be cities and putting edges between vertices if there is a road between the cities, that graph would not be simple since it can have self loops and it can have multiple edges between pairs of cities. Most of the families of graphs that we looked at were also connected in addition to being simple. We define a graph to be connected if there is a path from any vertex in the graph to any other vertex in the graph. If there exists a pair of vertices in the graph that has no path between them, we say that the graph is disconnected. So we can consider again an example of a graph whose vertices are locations and whose edges represent unordered pairs of locations that have direct roads between them. If this graph is disconnected, that would mean that there exist two locations, A and B, in the graph for which it's not possible to find a path on the roads from A to B. One of the simplest possible graphs that we can consider is the order zero graph, which is also called the null graph. This is the unique graph that has no vertices and no edges. In other words, the vertex set and the edge set are both the empty set. Another special family of graphs that we can consider are the edgeless graphs of order n. For each n, there exists a unique graph on n vertices with no edges. In a previous video, we defined this term called k-regularity. And we said that a k-regular graph 
is a graph in which every vertex has degree k. So we can see by the definition of empty graphs and k regularity that empty graphs are zero regular. If we consider again the graph of a social network and we suppose that the graph is an empty graph, that would represent a network where no one has connections to anyone else. It would be a very useless social network. If our graph represents a map of locations with roads between them, an empty graph would represent a set of locations for which it's impossible to travel between any two of the locations. Now we're going to discuss subgraphs, which are a special type of graph. We say that a graph H is a subgraph of a graph G if the vertex and edge sets of H are subsets of the vertex and edge sets of G respectively. For example, if we consider any graph G and any complete graph whose vertex set is a superset of the vertex set of G, then that complete graph will contain G as a subgraph. A triangle is a special kind of complete graph. It's just a complete graph on three vertices. A graph on three vertices with all possible edges. We also write it as K3. We can note that no bipartite graph has a triangle subgraph. If a bipartite graph did have a triangle subgraph, then two of the vertices in the triangle would either have to be in the L part of the bipartite graph or the R part of the bipartite graph. And by the definition of bipartite graphs, there can be no edges between vertices in L, and there can be no edges between vertices in R. If we have a social network graph, and that graph has no triangle subgraph, that tells us that in the social network, there are no three users who are all friends with each other. More generally, if our social network graph has no KN subgraph, so no complete graph of order N subgraph, that means that there are no N users in the network who are all friends with each other. In the last slide, we looked at subgraphs. Now we're going to consider a special kind of subgraph called an induced subgraph. We say that a subgraph H of G is an induced subgraph of G if the edge set of H consists of all edges UV from G for which both U and V are vertices in H. Let's look at a few examples. The complete graph K5 contains a P5 subgraph, P5 being the path on five vertices. However, the complete graph K5 does not contain P5 as an induced subgraph because it's missing edges. We define an independent set in a graph to be an empty induced subgraph. In other words, it's a set of vertices with no edges between them. If we look at the social network graph again, containing an empty graph of order five 
just as a subgraph wouldn't really give us any useful information about the social network other than that it has at least five users. On the other hand, suppose that our social network graph contains an empty graph of order five as an induced subgraph. That actually tells us a lot more. It tells us that there are at least five users in the network for which none of those users are friends with each other. Another special type of subgraph that we can consider is a connected component. And a connected component of G is simply a maximum connected subgraph of G. If G is a connected graph, then G will only have a single connected component. And that connected component will be the whole graph G. If G is a disconnected graph though, then G will have at least two connected components. Another special type of subgraph that we can consider is a cycle subgraph. And we define a graph to be acyclic if it has no cycle subgraph. For example, the family of paths that we saw in an earlier video. This is a standard acyclic family. The empty graph, that is another nice acyclic family. Another word for an acyclic graph is a forest. If we require an acyclic graph to be connected, then it is called a tree. Suppose that we have a graph where the vertices are locations and the edges are formed by roads between the vertices. If that graph is a forest and we are driving on it, then if we make a wrong turn on the roads of this graph, then we will always have to make a U-turn, regardless of where that wrong turn was. On the other hand, if this graph where the locations are vertices and the edges are roads between them, if this graph is not a forest, if it, in other words, is not acyclic, then there is a spot in the graph where we can make a wrong turn and we can avoid having to make a U-turn. In other words, we can take advantage of the cycle to fix our wrong turn, if we make the wrong turn in the right spot in the graph. This assumes that all the roads in the graph are two-way. So we've seen forests and trees, and we know that paths, since they are acyclic and connected, are a special kind of tree. Another special kind of tree is a star. A star has a special vertex called the center, and all of the other vertices in the star have degree one, and they are neighbors with the center. Another name for the star on n plus one vertices is k sub one comma n, the complete graph bipartite complete graph with parts of size one and n. If we consider the social network graph again, and that graph has a star on n plus one vertices as a subgraph, then we can conclude that there is some user in the social network who has at least n friends. Here is another family of graphs. This might be one that you haven't seen before. We say that a graph 
is k degenerate if every subgraph of the graph has a vertex of degree at most k. So let's look at a few examples of k degenerate graphs. The empty graphs that we looked at in an earlier slide, they are clearly zero degenerate. K regular graphs are clearly K degenerate because the degree of the vertices in any subgraph must be at most K. Here is a problem for you. Prove or disprove that all acyclic graphs are one degenerate. Now, let's briefly consider some special kinds of vertices. We say that a vertex is called isolated if it has degree zero. If it has degree one, we call the vertex a leaf. And if the vertex is neighbors, with every other vertex in the graph, we will call that vertex universal. So we can consider the social network graph again. And in the social network graph, an isolated vertex would simply be a user with no friends. A leaf would be a user with only one friend. And finally, a universal vertex would be a user who is friends with everyone in the network. For example, Tom on MySpace. Now we'll move on to graph parameters. The first parameter is a word that I think I've said before, but I'm not sure if I ever defined it. So if there was any confusion because of that, I apologize. The order of a graph is the number of vertices in the graph. The clique number of a graph G is the maximum N for which G contains the complete graph KN as a subgraph. And the independence number of a graph G is the maximum n for which g contains an edgeless graph of order n as an induced subgraph. Let's look back at the social network graph. In the social network graph, the clique number is just the largest group of users that are all friends with each other, the number of users in that group specifically. The independence number is the largest number of users in the network that are all not friends with each other. The distance between two vertices, U and V in a graph, is just the number of edges in a shortest path that connects U and V. Let's look at some examples of distance. For example, if we look at the distance between the endpoints of a P5, a path on five vertices, that distance between the endpoints is four because there are four edges between the endpoint vertices on a P5. If we look at two distinct leaves in a star, the distance between them is two. In the real world, there are things that are actual distance measures. For example, collaboration networks for acting and academic publications. There is this distance measure called degrees of Kevin Bacon. And that is a measure 
of your distance and collaboration connections to Kevin Bacon, where the collaboration connections are acting in the same movie. The Erdős numbers are similar. They are a measure of distance and collaboration connections, where the collaboration connections represent co-authoring the same paper. Now that we define distance, we can define the diameter of a graph. And the diameter is simply the greatest distance between two vertices in the graph. For example, if we look at any complete graph, it has diameter one, as long as the number of vertices is at least two. If we look at a star, with at least two leaves, its diameter will be two. And finally, the diameter of Pn, the path on n vertices, is n minus one. And we already saw that for n equals five. Just like we define distance, we can define this other kind of measure that is only on one vertex instead of two, and it's called eccentricity. Eccentricity of a vertex U and G is the greatest distance from U to any other vertex in G. If we look at the center vertex of a star, its greatest distance to any other vertex in the star is one, so it has eccentricity one. If we look instead at a leaf in the star, its greatest distance to any other vertex in the star is two, which is its distance to any other leaf in the star. So the eccentricity of a leaf in a star is two. We define the radius of a graph to be the minimum eccentricity over all vertices in the graph. If we look at the example of the complete graph of order n or the star of order n plus one, these both have a radius of one. If we look at a path of order two n plus one, a path with an odd number of vertices, we see that the radius is going to be n. If we look at a disconnected graph, by definition of radius, it must have infinite radius. If we look at a vertex in our graph that has eccentricity equal to the radius, that vertex has a special name. And it's the same name that we use for the star. We just call that vertex the center of the graph. For example, if we consider a path of order 2n plus 1, it will have a single center, the vertex right in the middle of the path. On the other hand, if we consider a path of order 2n, that path will have two centers because it has an even number of vertices. The complete graph of order n has n centers. Every vertex can be chosen as the center. If we look at a graph where vertices are locations where people live, and edges are trails or roads between locations, and we place a store at the center of this graph. Then we're placing the store somewhere that minimizes the maximum possible distance that someone has to travel from their home to go to the store. 
we defined k degenerate before. There's a related term called degeneracy. And the degeneracy of a graph G is just the minimum value of k for which G is k degenerate. For example, k regular graphs have degeneracy equal to k. Here's a problem for you to think about. Prove or disprove that if G has M edges and N vertices, then the degeneracy of G is at least M over N. Thank you very much for watching.